Welcome to everybody online. So um, the all group has been um, in action for some time, it's had a little bit of a break. And so welcome back to the webinar. So we're going to run a webinar style meeting today. We are also recording this session. So it'll be possible to get access to that recording as well. So you'll be able to watch it again or share it with your friends and colleagues. So today's topic is what does this look like at your age? And it's presented by Stephen Kosky, who's known to most of the all people. So welcome, Stephen. And um, and myself is um, I'm Professor Catherine Bontoya from the Pamela Institute. So some of you may be new to the webinar format, and um, and therefore I thought I might just let you know, just in terms of managing the Zoom webinar. We're actually really open to people making comments along the way or asking questions. And a good way of doing that is by going down to the bottom of the chat bar where it's got a little voice bubble and um, you can click on that and, and pop in any comments that you'd like to share with Stephen and myself and others. With the recording, the, the people watching the recording won't see the chat bar. So, um, so feel welcome to leave any comments if you like. But um, if you're connecting from Australia or around the world, we, we do like to acknowledge the country and the Pamela Institute, as long as as well as the All Group would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting. And I'm in Wurundjeri country in um, Melbourne, Victoria at the moment. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today as well and from other places around the world. We extend this respect to all Indigenous peoples from around the world and to any First Nations people who come across any of the material below. And the All Group was commenced from, by Francis McNabb and working in sync with Stephen Kosky. So I'd love to hand you over to Stephen Kosky at this point. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. It's such an, um, an honour and a privilege to continue to be involved with AWE and um, to continue the legacy of Francis. And as we thought about the topic for, for today's um, webinar, it seems appropriate to choose a topic that's actually the title of one of Dr. McNabb's books uh, called Bliss, as we just recently had the opportunity to celebrate uh, the life and the rich legacy of this remarkable man and to express our gratitude for the difference he made and continues to make in so many lives, including ours. So I'm thrilled to continue to be involved with all. I'm really thrilled to uh, renew my connection um, with Ken Miller. I'm really delighted to be here and to share this opportunity with Catherine. And so today, bliss. What is bliss? And what does bliss look like as you age. I think of Joseph Campbell, who encouraged all of us to follow your bliss. Well, what exactly does that look like? And what is, you know, what does that mean? When I think of bliss, I think it can be as simple as listening to music and just being overcome by the, the beauty and the power of music. And it can be as extraordinary as, say, the birth of a grandchild or a great grandchild, um, or the accomplishment of, of something you've been working extremely hard at for a long, long time. When I think of bliss, how I define bliss, and I really encourage, I do encourage you to ask questions in the chat. Uh, I encourage you to write your definition of bliss in the chat. What does bliss look like to you? Um, when I think of bliss, I think I define it as being so immersed in an experience, whatever that experience might be, that you kind of lose self-consciousness and you experience a sense of peace and contentment and joy. Catherine, I'd be curious, how do you define bliss? What does it look like for you? Yeah, good question. I think bliss... For me, it's like a, a state of being, really. It's um, all encompassing, and it's um, and it also is a sense of quietness for me, a quiet inner joy and, and happiness. 
it's not necessarily something that's super static, but just somewhere where I do connect with that sense of contentment, I guess, but along with those feelings of inner joy and happiness. That's bliss. Thanks. I love that word contentment. Um, I love the quote by Eleanor Roosevelt where she said, beautiful young people are accidents of nature. Beautiful old people are works of art. And when I read that quote, it just made me curious as to whether bliss is something we, when, when I think of the, the term works of art, is bliss something that we can curate? Is bliss something that we can kind of, of create? Uh, another writer, another beautiful writer by the name of Annie Dillard said, um, how we spend our days, how we spend our moments is how we spend our lives. So the question I want to pose is particularly as we age, can we curate, curate, can we create more moments in our days that provide opportunities for bliss, for contentment, for peace, for joy? Because if we can create more moments for bliss, we might have more of a blissful life. So there are five things that I think might contribute to curating opportunities for bliss and um, relationships, equanimity, mindfulness, priorities, gratitude. We're going to touch on each briefly. I, again, in the chat, I encourage you to ask questions. I, I encourage you to add your five things. I mean, these are, these are the five things that, that I think are important, but it'd be great to hear what yours are as well. So let's start with relationships. I mean, this idea that the quality of our life is really the quality of our relationships. Uh, Harvard Uni University here in the United States conducted, and actually it continues, they, didn't, they haven't stopped, it continues to this day. It's been an 80 year study on happiness, well-being, satisfaction, and, and contentment. This, this study, it's actually called the Harvard Study of Adult Development. It's, it's essentially called a study on happiness. And they wrote a book uh, kind of sharing the findings of the study. And the book is called The Good Life. I often, you know, when I think of bliss, I think one of the most important questions that we can, that we can ask ourselves is, what makes for a good day? Now, how I would answer that question probably be different how you would answer that question. But what makes for a good day? Because I suspect the more good days we have, we might have a better chance of having a good life. Well, the study began in 1938. Uh, and Harvard tracked the mental health and the well-being and the satisfaction of, of over 800 uh, at least it began with men. I, I believe that they're, uh, they've become a little bit more enlightened and are studying women as well now. Um, but for 80 years, they've been tracking people and they've been interviewing them every single year, trying to determine what contributes to mental health and well being. And what they concluded the biggest contributor to our mental health, our well-being, our satisfaction, our joy, our contentment is the quality of our relationships. What they discovered is that those who expressed a sense of satisfaction, uh, a sense of, of, of joy in their relationships in their 50s and 60s were significantly more likely to be healthier and happier in their 80s and 90s. And what they discovered, what those who claimed or described to have positive relationships and strong social networks, 
also experience less mental deterioration. So, I mean, the argument here is that, that good relationships in some ways even protect our brain. And I was thinking of this and, um, and uh, I play golf, I love golf. And golf can be a contributor to my frustration. <laughs> and every now and then it can be a contributor to my bliss. Um, but I, I experienced the, the, the goal of every golfer, a hole in one. Now this should have been the most joyful, blissful experience you could possibly have. And I have to confess, I think it was one of the most miserable experiences I've ever had in my life. Any ideas why? I was all by myself. So I hit this perfect shot and it took two bounces and in the hole. And I wanted to jump up and shout for joy. And no one was there to witness it. No one was there to share it. So it just kind of reminded me that life is to be lived in relationships. And the quality of our life has a lot to do with the quality of our relationships. So I think to curate, curate a life that has more bliss in it is to pay attention to our relationships. What's the, the status, the, the health, the quality of our relationships and, and how might we nurture those relationships? I have a few thoughts on that, but I'd be curious um, of your thoughts, Catherine, on how we might well, one, on how relationships contribute to our, our health and well-being and joy, but also how we might attend to that. Yeah, for sure. So certainly relationships have been shown in many numerous psychological studies to be important to people's sense of well-being and connectedness is, is so important. And the one thing as a psychologist that I know is that, you know, and reflecting back on my childhood and growing up that, you know, I heard a lot of sayings through life, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of people here online have also heard a lot of sayings, and, and one of them being that blood is thicker than water, and another one being you choose your friends, not your relatives, and if you hear these sayings enough, they sort of become truths, and, and we live by them. But I guess that they're also confusing, aren't they, when the sayings are very different, and those two sayings are very much about relationships. And so I think one of my biggest tips around building relationships is to think about where you get that feeling of positive feeling for your relationships. Who is it that you're with at the time and, and expanding, you know, your time that you spend with people who help you feel good. It doesn't mean that you have to cut other people out of your life, but it just might mean that you just reduce that a little bit. So um so I think having a think about and reflecting on whether they're a relative or they're a friend, but, but who helps you feel good and expanding the times when you meet with them. That'd be my biggest tip. One aspect I think that's great. One aspect I think that is really important too is to think of relationships like banking. <laughs> and uh, the amount of, of joy and, and satisfaction and happiness we have in our relationships is really the status of our account, how full is our account, our relationship account. And withdrawals are inevitable, just as conflict is inevitable. There are always gonna be withdrawals um, from our relationships. Are we making deposits? Are we intentional about making deposits? Because sometimes we can take the people in our life for granted. And uh, one, one, a factor that I think is really important is to just be really intentional and pay attention to the people in our life and ask ourselves each day, well, where can I make deposits in this person's life? And where can I make deposits in a relationship uh, with each other? Um, so relationships, I think it's the study at Harvard discovered it's not only the significant relationships like our partners, our children, they even discovered that that casual relationships contribute to a sense of well-being in one's life. You know, how you treat the clerk uh, at the grocery store or at the post office, um, 
how you treat your um, the people you work with. Um, the study discovered that those who had a, a long work life, those who are retired, experience more joy the ones who experience more joy and well-being are the ones who are able to replace their workmates <laughs> with playmates so the relationships and work were really really important and now they're retired so they channeled that energy in well who's who can i play with <laughs> who can i enjoy life with um so relationships the quality of your life is the quality of relationships. So the next one, curating a sense of bliss, is this sense of, you mentioned the word contentment, the sense of equanimity, the sense of, of just, ah, peace um, deep inside. And I think the capacity to experience bliss is related to the capacity to be able to regulate our emotions. Because life is rarely the way we think it should be. <laughs> what is the bumper sticker? I, I, won't, I won't use profanity. Uh, stuff happens. And, and usually we have very little control over the things that happen in life. I think one of the ways to increase our contentment, our peace, our joy, our bliss, is to recognize that we may not have control over what happens. We get to choose how we respond to what happens. That same Harvard study um, on the good life, that same Harvard study that looked at uh, people who experience well being and satisfaction and happiness as they age, were the ones who were intentional about choosing a positive attitude, uh, regardless of the things that happen to them in life. They may not be able to control what happens, but they can choose their attitude in response to what happens. Now, how, how I understand this is that between what happens in our life and how we respond, there's space, there's a gap. And in that gap, is our capacity to choose how we respond. I think in that gap is humor. In that gap is perspective. In that gap, I think, is, is bliss. But for most of us, that gap is razor thin. Um, I mean, for example, have you ever overreacted? <laughs> and of course, we've all overreacted. And uh, I think of that, if you think of a scale from one to 10, where one is you're content, you're calm, you're at peace. And 10 is you're about ready to throw this computer. Um, you, you, you're about ready to lose it. As we Americans say, you're about ready to blow a gasket. Is that an Australian term as well? Blow a gasket? Yeah. So you're about ready to blow a gasket. I actually think we live life at eight. That I think there's so much coming at us. There's so much stimulus coming at us. There's so much stress coming at us. There are so many demands coming at us. There's 24 seven breaking news coming at us. There's everything coming at us. That we live our life at eight. That we just become used to that. We've kind of just accommodated that. But notice it's a very short jump from eight to 10. So all it takes is one little thing, oh, and we react. So I think one of the challenges is to widen the gap. I think one of the ways to get from eight down to three or four is to widen the gap, to create more space. To find more breathing space. Because there's no such thing as perfect. I think one of the challenges is to experience bliss 
to find beauty, to experience joy in all of the imperfections. You know, we often think, well, I'm going to experience bliss. I'm going to experience joy. I'm going to get to being happy when the problem is overcome or the conflict is resolved or the mess is cleaned up. And the paradox is, if we work at creating space, if we work at thinking, well, what are the things that delight me? What are the things that bring me joy? Can I just breathe more? We're going to actually change our mind-body state to be able to bring more energy, more creativity, a more positive out. Uh, more positive attitude, more resources to the challenges and the problems in life. What do you think of that word equanimity, Catherine, and its relationship to bliss? Yeah, I think um, when I think of equanimity, I often think of um, emotional intelligence as, um, and as we talk about the um, ability to recognize how you're feeling and the emotions that are governing your thoughts and behaviours that follow. And so being aware of your emotions and, and beforehand and even now thinking about what emotions you feel and connect with when particular events or triggers happen and, um, and that over-consuming, overwhelming feeling or desire to react straight away, just learning just to breathe. I think you used the word before, Stephen, about breathing and just sort of taking some breaths and maybe putting that idea on hold. Because I think we all know that if we give and have some time to contemplate a situation, often we come up with more options. So if we allow that space from feeling the emotion to how we respond, we can generate a few more options. And um, we can always come back to an event and, and deal with it a little bit later. And I think that's where the bliss comes from, from that sense of, not being a victim to your own emotions, but just being able to manage them in a healthy way. We need emotions. They tell us things, but it's about managing the emotions. Yeah. I love that. You mentioned, mentioned breath. I often, I often use the imagery of, of our first breath often gets caught in our chest and our shoulders. And that's where our that's where tension lives. That's where fear lives. That's where anxiety lives. Kind of, we find our our shoulders up by our ears, and I think that's how we end up reacting. That's how we experience that gap being razor thin in that first breath. And our our breath tends to be kind of shallow um, and and rapid. So the imagery I often think about is: Can you take a second breath? You know, sometimes the first breath happens when they're not even aware of it. You know, we just all of a sudden we're anxious, <laughs> we're tense, we're afraid. So can we take that second breath? You know, allow our breath to drop deeper and take a deeper breath. And maybe in that second breath is that's where our wisdom is. That's where our strength is. That's where bliss is. That's where peace is. So I think a second breath, which kind of relates to the next one, which is mindful. I think it's um, recognizing that the only power you have, the only power you have to experience bliss, if we all desire to experience more bliss, if we all desire to experience more peace, if we all desire to experience more happiness, you can only experience happiness in the present, in the now, in the moment. You, you, don't ex you can't experience bliss or contentment or peace, ruminating about what happened yesterday, fearing what might happen tomorrow. You can only experience it right now, in this moment. I, I'm currently at the beach, I'm on vacation. <laughs> And and um, I have two dogs that I love to walk the dogs on the beach. And I noticed in the first two days, um, I, I was like everybody else on the beach. I noticed everybody walking on the beach early in the morning had their smartphone in their hand. And, and everybody was kind of capturing, 
you know, capturing the sunrise, capturing the, the right photo, capturing the beauty. And I noticed as I had my phone in my hand, where my thoughts were, weren't on, wasn't in the moment. My thoughts were, well, how can I get the perfect picture? Because I want to, I want to post the perfect picture on social media. So all of these other people can see the perfect life, <laughs> you know, that I'm living. And that wasn't bliss. The third morning, I forgot my phone. And the difference was amazing. I mean, that just was amazing. I didn't have my phone. So all I did was walk my dogs. All I did was feel the sand between my toes. All I did was breathe in the sea air. All I did was just notice and pay attention to how the light of the sunrise sparkled off the water. All I did was pay attention. This particular beach has a lot of sand dollars of the intricacies of the sand dollars that washed up on the shore. And just my own just sense of, of bliss and peace and calm. The second breath was profound compared to the mornings that I had my phone in, in hand wanting to capture the right picture. Um, so it's recognizing how to stay, how to stay in the moment. Catherine, what do you think is helpful to be mindful? I mean, the poet Mary Oliver said, wisdom, the beginning of wisdom is simply paying attention. That's beautiful. So um, I think mindfulness is, is, for me, an easier thing to do in the morning when I wake up and my day is a little bit slower. And I know that during the course of the day, different things happen, different people might call on the phone, different demands, different appointments to go through. And the day starts to wind up and get busier and busier. And I guess your important point, or one of the points there, Stephen, is that it's so important to be present and in the moment. And I often think it's really helpful to be proactive about mindfulness and not wait until you're in a state of the feeling a bit chaotic and thinking, oh my gosh, it's time to be mindful now. But it's um but it's a matter of even just every hour on the hour, just stop and take a breath. You'll feel the feet, where your feet touching the ground and just being aware of where you are and just slowing your thoughts down and then just sort of starting again for the next hour. So I'd be proactive would be my big, big tip. I think one of the gifts of aging, one of the, the really wonderful gifts as you get older is you begin to realize that the goal of life is to not, is not to get from point A, a to point B as fast as you can. That maybe the questions that you ask as you age particularly isn't what did I, what do I, what did I achieve today? What did I accomplish today? Uh, what did I acquire today? I think the questions that we ask, I think as we age that help with mindfulness is what did I notice today? Um, what, what was I awakened to today? What did I see today? Where did I see beauty? Where did I experience delight? What brought me joy? You know, which gets back to that question of, well, what makes a good day? And I think it's impossible to have a good day if you're not mindful and pay attention um, to those moments that actually help you have a good day. The next point is also related to that and recognizing I think it's difficult to experience bliss without a sense of what's really important to you, without a sense of priorities. I often say the things that are most important in life are always at the mercy of what is least important in life. I, uh, I'm a clergy person, it's one of the roles that I play. And in that, I'm privileged to spend a lot of time with people at the end of their lives. Uh, I've spent a lot of time with people as they breathe their last. And I would say hundreds of people. And I've never once heard someone say at the end of their life, oh, gosh, I wish I could drive my car one more time. Or, 
<laughs> they're not talking about the things they've achieved or the things they've acquired. Uh, not that those things are necessary, they're, they're not bad at all. But without exception, what people are talking about is the people in their life and who they love and, and who loves them. And there's this, this profound sense of what's most important that can often, um, often get lost. Um, Richard Rohr, who's a Catholic priest, says, we spend the first half of our life building the container. And somewhere along the line, we look in the container and it may not hold the things that are most important. And so we need to make sure that we place in our container the things we value the most. I think one aspect of experiencing bliss, I think particularly as we age is, is what I like to say is to claim or reclaim your unlived life. So for example, what are those things in your childhood or those things of your young self that somehow got lost in growing up? You know, what inner qualities um, or what outward activities somehow got neglected as a result of the first half of life commitments that we make? I mean, you ask a group of kindergartners, how many of you can sing? <laughs> Not only do they all raise their hand, I can sing, they start singing. Or you ask, how many of you can dance? And not only do they raise their hand, they start dancing. And somehow, in just the seriousness of living our lives, we start asking, well, if you ask me if I can sing, well, what quality do you mean? Or, or, or we just get busy and, and we lose sight of those things that used to actually just make us come alive, that used to bring us joy. So I think a great question to ask is what got lost in the living? You know, T.S. Eliot, the poet said, uh, where is the life that has become lost in the living? And, and maybe to experience bliss as we age is to reclaim some of that. Maybe it's going to dance classes. Maybe it's learning to paint. Maybe it's taking up an instrument. Um, to really asking that question, what makes you most alive? What are your thoughts on that, Catherine? Yeah, I really like your um, talking about the children, the analogy to kids and, and things too, because I think we do lose some of the aspects of um, our childhood as we get older and with the seriousness of all the responsibilities. And I think that's a lovely suggestion of yours, Stephen, to think back about you know, what gave you joy as a child and what can you bring in now and do at this stage? I know when I think about priorities for me, I think about some of the, the planning and just reflection time about what those priorities are in some ways is just as important as setting the priorities. If I think about my priorities and start listing them, yes, I've got to get this done today and this done tomorrow, I do kind of find a lot of value of just breathing again, taking my time and thinking about what should I be doing or what could I be doing and um, and having those things guide what my priorities are. But the planning too is important. There is a um, gentleman by the name of Gary Hagen who um, has devoted his entire life to helping free uh, people whose lives have become human trafficked. I mean, it's tough, tough work, stressful work, um, really difficult work. And he was asked how he copes with that. And he said something really quite profound. He said, I never lose sight of what brings me joy. I make sure to prioritize the things that bring me joy, like spending time with my grandchildren, uh, playing, he plays the guitar, playing the guitar, and he listed a whole lots of various things. 
because he said, and I thought this was so profound. He said, joy is the oxygen we need when the air is thin. And I just thought that was so beautiful. I mean, life is hard. Life is hard for, and, and even as we add, not even, but as we age, life can be extraordinarily hard. There are many challenges that we face. The air can be really thin. And joy, joy, prioritizing joy, prioritizing those things that, that make you come alive is the oxygen we need when the air is thin. I might add on to that, Stephen, because I think it's just reminding me of an oxygen analogy, actually. <laughs> but yeah. often when people fly on planes and they talk about when the oxygen masks fall, that you're to provide your own oxygen before you give it to a child. And um, because what that's saying is that you need oxygen to be able to help other people. And I think I know from some of the older people I know in my life, they've lived a life of a lot of giving before. And, yeah. um, and I'm just saying that I think part of the, and thinking that part of the priorities is, is making sure that you're actually prioritising your own needs in here, just as much as the needs of other people as well. Um, and making sure that you give yourself permission to prioritise what you could be doing. So yeah. just a quick thought. Well, it's so important. I, I often say self-care is not selfish. Self self-care is good stewardship of the one thing we've been given to offer this world, which is the gift of our presence. And, and the more we can care for ourselves so that we can bring the fullness of our presence, that we can bring a joyful presence um, to this world, um, that's the gift we give to all of the people that we will inter interact with each and every day. Uh, so it brings me to the last point, which is gratitude. And just remembering that it is not joy that makes us grateful. It's actually gratitude that makes us joyful. Daily gratitude, actually, it might sound kind of, I always say Oprah Winfrey-ish, um, but it's actually been scientifically proven to experience daily gratitude um, enhances our overall, our overall well-being and happiness. And I think one of the things about gratitude to me that we forget is bliss can be just waking each day, taking nothing for granted. We take so much for granted. Recognizing that every breath that we're given is sheer gift. Every heartbeat that comes after each heartbeat is sheer gift. The phrase I often use is a grateful heart, a heart centered in gratitude, is a peaceful heart, is a loving heart, is a blissful heart. I think sometimes the challenge in life is to hold life's sorrow in one hand and and life is hard and life is difficult and life is loss and there is much grief to life. So to hold our sorrow in one hand tenderly and to hold our gratitude, to be grateful in the other hand and to allow both to enlarge our hearts. Um, I think it takes, it takes a lot of courage to grieve, but I think it takes a, particular kind of spiritual courage to allow ourselves to be grateful in the midst of our grief. So what do you, Catherine, what do you think of gratitude as, as a key to curating bliss? I think it's one of the fundamental five things that you've been talking about today, Stephen. And, um, and I think in, in particular times of sorrow, I think just remembering things that you can be grateful for you might not always feel it at the time, but, but in time, you can connect so much with, with that feeling of, of gratitude in general. So um, so I think it is just one of those fundamental building blocks of um, being able to get to bliss. 
which I think also can lead us full circle back to point number one, which is relationships. And if, if the Harvard study of happiness was correct, that relationships are, are essential to our experience of, of happiness and bliss, um, maybe it's taking time to say thank you uh, to the people in our life. I often ask the question, do people feel important in your presence? I think probably the one, one of the most important questions you can ask that has the potential to transform all our relationships from the clerk at the store to the person we live with is just a simple question. Do people feel important and valued in, in our presence? And what can we do to help them to feel seen and heard and valued? And I think one of the things we can do that we don't do nearly enough is express our gratitude to them and for them. And speaking of gratitude, I'm super grateful to have this opportunity to be in conversation with you, Catherine, and those who are online. Um, great to continue this. Yeah, it's been um, good hearing your wise words, Stephen, and um, I've got a lot of gratitude for being able to be part of this and, and hearing hearing your thoughts. Um, just in summary, I guess, it's just, I think these five elements are, are very much linked. And I think the one thing that I took away was just hearing that sort of narrative or that story about perhaps slowing down, taking time, purposefully thinking about your relationships and, and not what you should be doing, but about who, what you could be doing and, and what things bring you joy and maximising those things in your life and setting the priorities around that, as well as the priorities around yourself. And, and with that, with some gratitude for the people around you who help build us and, and keep our quality of life sound and whole. So um, so thank you very much, Stephen. So much appreciated. I don't think anyone's been brave enough to use the chat function <laughs> today, but, um, but that's quite okay. We've still got a little bit more to go. So, um, so I'm just wondering, because what would help Stephen and I moving forward is it would love to know what you would like to know about in these sessions too. So I'm just going to share a poll with you just now. I'm going to launch the poll. So it should come up on your screen now. So um, there are three questions. There's, did you enjoy today's discussion topic? And um, there's another question, was the information relevant to you? And then also, would you recommend the all group to a friend, family member or colleague? And then if you did want to put something into the chat box, so that means that you need to click on the little the word bubble and, um, and, and a little window should pop up where you could write in something um, like the topics that you would like us to cover in the future. Or you could also send an email back to Lana Windsor at Camilla too. And we can take all that on board and um, and learn from that. So we've had, I think everybody's responded now to the poll. So um, so that's excellent. This information helps Stephen and I make sure what we're doing is, is what you'd like them to hear about and have some value from. So I will remove that and... Um, and there we go. I think most people have been happy. So that's great. And there are questions there. And um, and also, as I said, any topics in the future, just send them through to, to Lana. Also, I did want to just make a small comment too, just rounding back to our earlier conversation about Francis McNabb. And, and he commenced the Big Tent Project quite some time ago. And if you did enjoy today's session, it's not the main purpose for us to provide this session, but you're welcome to make any donation to the Big Tent Project at all by using the QR code or certainly going onto the Pan Miller website. And I believe next month we're going to hear about one of Stephen's um, fundraising initiatives that he's got underway too. So, um, so just to keep that in mind. So next month, um, you're welcome to join us again. 
and this is on, and then the topic is on managing conflict in relationships. So out of today's five areas, one of those areas was relationships. And we'll do a deep dive in, in, into conflict in relationships. So that'll be on the 3rd of August from 1 to 2 p.m. And you'll also receive a, a reminder and, and a notification from the Camilla Institute as well. So otherwise, do you have any last words at all, Stephen? But for me, I'd just like to thank you for listening and we'll be sharing this recording at a later stage. Um, it looked like somebody raised their hand. I don't know if you have the capacity to recognize that person or or am I am I seeing something that isn't there? I haven't I can't see anything from my end. I'm not sure, Lana, okay. if you can. Sorry, I can't see from my end. So if we have missed something, just, just email us through and um and we will we will connect soon. So have a really lovely, enjoyable month, everybody. And hopefully we'll see you next month. Thanks so much. Thank you. There is something in the chat now. Yeah. Great. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.